We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. From the hills of Strawberry Canyon, I'm Coin Dang, and this is the Golden Bear Cast. Let's go, go Bears! And welcome back to another episode of the California Golden Bear Cast, the part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. And we're here uh, after second loss in a row, uh, the first time under Coach Wilcox that we have gone 0 and 2 um, in conference play. The first time we've we're gonna, we're. I mean, we have a loss in out of conference game uh, in the regular season uh, under Coach Wilcox, but we've lost two now. Uh, I believe this is the first zero and two start since the two thousand and one season. That's the last time. But before we get into all of that, I am one of your hosts, Rob Hong. Alongside me, of course, is your other host, Andy Johnson. Andy, it is Tuesday evening. How are you doing this Tuesday evening? Well, quick shout out to you. You definitely have the smoothest intro of the two of us. Always get that blue wire pod, you know, smooth, gotta, smooth as butter. Got to talk about the mother shit, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got to gotta talk about the overlords. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're 0-2. Who saw that coming? Maybe a few people. Did you see it coming the way that it manifested on Saturday? Did anyone really see this coming? I mean, when you were thinking set, when you said seven and five, was Owen to start a part of a seven and five potential? No, definitely not. Yeah, but I could see us going two and zero oh next two games. Yeah, Washington is abysmal, and Sac State. I don't know if we lose to Sac State, I'll have to I'll have to find my <laughs> seven wins another way. I mean, regardless, right? If the Bears want to make a bowl game, and I tweeted this out. The Bears will have to go above 500 in Pac-12 conference play, which they haven't done since Jeff Tedford's tenure here. Yeah, but it's also the worst Pac-12 we've seen in a long time. Exactly. So this is prime opportunity <laughs> to go to go above. But um, I want to talk about a couple things before we talk about the Cal game in itself. And as you said, it's a good pivot from what you're talking about, the Pac-12 being so abysmal, right? First thing is like oh, from the Pac-12 North, right? Oregon wins. Great game against Ohio State uh, in the morning. Was an absolute fun game to watch from a person who doesn't have any vetted interest. But they win. Stanford creams SC, and we'll talk about the ramifications from that game later. Uh, And then Washington State creams Portland State. But Michigan beats Washington at the big house. Oregon State beats Hawaii in the late game. So there's a bunch of teams now sitting at... 1-2, 1-1, 0-2, one and two, one and one, zero oh and two, and then Oregon being the only team that's two and zero. Oh. So it is ripe for the taking. Um, there's opportunity here. What now we have to? I mean, wishful thinking is that we turn it around starting the sack skate game, and we just start to put it together and we go on a little bit of a run here. But I digress. We need to talk about what happened with the Stanford SC game because the ramifications of that. Was that Clay Helton was fired? <laughs> oh man. 
And then not only was Clay Helton fired, but the Cal Twitter faithful decided to take it upon themselves to go into AD Mike. Is it Bone or Bon? Who's the SC, SCAD? I think it's, I don't know how to say his last name. That the first one was correct. Bon? Bone? 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 Matt Boner? That is not. If you know, the, the, uh, people have to watch the ah! people have to watch uh, Wandavision. It's a joke from Wandavision. Ralph Boner. It's a it's a it's a Wandavision joke. Anyways. Wow. Uh, anyways, narrowly letting you get away with it. It was a it's a Wandavision joke. Everyone's got. If you haven't watched, you gotta watch it. But anyways, uh, the Cal Twitter faithful decides to go into that tweet that the USC AD puts out on the statement of them letting uh, Clay Helton go and moving on from him and start tweeting as if they're high, high paying donors, right? Total troll posts. Like I am withholding my multi-million dollar, you know, f- uh, donations until you rehire Clay Helton or that, you know, I'm upset that you made this move. Um, and this art and those tweets became the subject of an article on the SF gate today. <laughs> so a bunch of Cal Twitter follows uh, that you might know, like uh, Rex Volcano and um, our dear, my dear friend Ben, um, their Twitter's like made it onto this SF Gate article where they're, and Twist and Hook, of course, as well, uh, in that article, just acting as if, and people were getting upset at them, like in the comments, like underneath them, replying to them, be like, if you were a real donor, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't be like replying, you'd be DMing him or you'd have his phone number on speed dial. Totally joke, just over the head, right? You just, it just and people just didn't get it, uh, but yeah, I mean, what a hilarious, hilarious weekend! And I'm kind of sad that the Traveler States Thursday guys aren't here to do a pod on this because I would absolutely love to listen to their reactions. Like, imagine like an emergency pod that they probably have put out as soon as that announcement goes up. But Andy Clay Helton no longer at SC. You're smiling. But are you are you like a happy sad? Like the incompetence is gone, so like damn it. But you know, it is the first coach fired after UConn's coach uh just quit on the job. And it's a high profile program that fired their coach after week two. Well, I think that one, you know, you started to see Simon was so upset. <laughs> Who you know, of course, is our is our boy down there, and uh, he was he was just furious that I saw him say that he would n- potentially not watch a single SC game. He said he's definitely not going to attend a game from here on out, and he would not watch an additional game until Clay Helton was fired, and that's when I knew it was bad. So that was like your first first shot like cuz he's a pretty mild and also just like a pretty down to earth USC fan and that'd be like one of us kind of signaling that about Wilcox. It would be a pretty big deal. Yeah. So that seeing that was pretty wild, but I didn't really expect it cuz it's just so early and it's like well, you know, there's just there's who knows like you SC could have won every game in Pac-12 play and you never you just never know I think the thing is Stanford looked so bad against Kansas State and then just walloped SC at home and you just got the sense that I don't I mean I don't if SC, I have read an article today that said SC was going to go after James Franklin, who I don't think would leave midseason. Um, and then uh, Bill O'Brien, which is an interesting one. That would be the one that I think might make sense in, if it were to happen midseason. And, and then the one that absolutely will not happen, which is absolutely hilarious, Greg Schiano. And I think that but but SC look SC has had had to have SC is at the same point that Texas is in my mind. You have a program with a better legacy, better legacy. Mm-hmm. So let's distinguish they're they're not the same. But Texas constantly chases the supreme 
in spite of the good or the good plus. Right. I think they would even say they want to compete for a championship. If you could compete for a championship every four years and then be at least in it for half the season at any other time, they'd probably take it versus someone who's winning nine, going nine and three every single season. Mm -hmm. And SC is basically making the same play. And the sad part about this for me is actually not the fact that we don't get to play SC because at the end of the day, I don't give a, I don't care if their, you know, their interim head coach doesn't scare me whatsoever in regards to what our matchup is going to be with them. So I I actually don't think it has any difference. Mm -hmm. But the big piece is that he was genuinely an actual good guy. And everything that I was reading was all about how much his players loved him, how, how much class he brought to an SE program that lacks it. And to lose a caliber coach like that, I don't feel like celebrating it because that's what college sports is all about. It's about building young men up. And not churning and burning them out of a program in, in pursuit of a national title. So Essie's making the decision to obviously go after the title. And they're going to have to hope that somebody can do both of those things. And I don't know if those two things necessarily can live together in one in peace and harmony. So I, I sort of arrive at this saying, they were they ever really out of it? Did they ever not compete for the the only thing they weren't going after was the national title? Is this the right decision? And is Clay Hilton willing to hang out with his apparent buddy, Justin Wilcox, to give our offense <laughs> some advice? <laughs> because I think he's a good coach. I don't think he's the coach that SC wanted. But should Cal, they're not going to, nor should they, nor am I advocating for this, but for whatever reason, if we didn't have a head coach next season, I would be totally fine with Clay Hilton as our head coach. I mean, we at, at the very least, we know the recruiting part. He's he's amazing at, right? I mean, granted, it is the SC brand, so who knows, but he's kept that brand going. You know, it's... It's not. I, I can't be lost on people that they won a Pac-12 championship in just just three seasons ago. In 2017, they won a Pac-12 championship. They won the Rose Bowl in 2017. Um, but I guess I guess the devil's advocate for this for what you said would be if you're a pro- football program of that caliber, if you're not vying for national championships, then what are you looking to do? Like with that high, with that big of a budget. Right. And the amount of donor money that comes in probably through that program blows a bunch of programs out of the water, probably could keep a few programs in the Pac-12 afloat just with that budget alone. So if they're not vying for national championships, then what what's the point in terms of what they're trying to accomplish? I just last year, five and one year before that, eight and five. That's not okay at SC. Five and seven. That's not okay at SC. 11 and 3 and 10 and 3. Yep. I I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. The loss to the loss to Stanford hurts. Is this an overreaction? I think so. You're telling me you wouldn't just do this at the, what the hell does it what good does it do to do this in the middle of the season? I'm with you on that. I it it baffles me that they would do this just two games in. Like this isn't this isn't like three games away from the end of the season, and you see that this that the team has punt like it's just not working this year, and you're just making that decision a few weeks early so you can get a head start on on coaching hires. I get that part, but like the season's literally just started, and if the team decides to go what ten and two, like right, like let's say, or they go where they they only lost one game, right? So yeah, if they decided to go like eleven and one, if they happen to do that, like. Was that worth? I mean, as as you said, you just don't know what this team was would have been capable of 
and you just fired their head coach. In favor of guys that Don- you're not going to get in in the next week and a half, unless you're unless you can somehow magically pull Coach Peterson in, because he's just sitting on the Fox Sports uh, broadcast. But what coach is going to come in and do that? I don't know if there's been. I tweeted this out because I have actually no idea. I don't think there's ever been a, a college football team that's brought in a coach midseason like to take over as their like head coach going forward. It never. It doesn't happen. I can't. I can't think of yeah, it, it, I don't know Chris Peterson, the dude that turned down every damn big job because he wanted to stay off the grid in Boise, is then gonna then took the Washington job and retired because of his his heart wasn't in it anymore or what I don't know if I, that's paraphrasing but like you know what I don't know like. Chris Peterson retired seemingly because he, you know, he wanted to, he stepped down. It seemed like he was done. Like for him to go back into that role. I mean, I don't know. No one knows. I don't know. I it would be shocked if that happened, but you're telling me uh, you're going to bring in a quarterback's coach, cornerback's coach, cornerback's coach. Not even, not even the quarterback coach is Graham Harrell no. corner, like yeah. cornerback's yeah. coach. To take over an offensively built team, I would I would argue that the the hiring was one merely made, or the the interim position was merely made just to keep the recruiting class intact because he's one of their best recruiters, right? And two, I think that if you if you make a guy like him your head coach, like in terms of the bigger bigger decisions, then you kind of just leave the offense and the defense to do whatever they want. You're not, you're not gonna. None of the coordinators are gonna be able to be influenced in making decisions. Like Graham Harrell is not gonna run this offense however he wants to. If he wants to go for it on every single fourth down, there isn't a single person that's gonna be able mm-hmm. to overrule him, right? If the defensive coordinator, who I can't remember what his name is, wants to blitz engage eight on cover zero on every play there's going to be no person that overrides him in in that decision like that's what it's that's what this team is going to be for the next for the next uh what 10 weeks it's todd orlando todd orlando that's correct so that's that is what i would say is the most puzzling part of this why now yep just don't get it. Don't get it. Don't think it's a good look on the university. Don't think it's a good look for the players. Don't think it's a good look on a coach who didn't do anything really wrong. Overall, just bad optics. So I guess in some ways I should be happy. Well, the winner is SC. Well, so. the winner, the winner is Clay Helton because he walks away with I think close to ten million dollars. Ten million dollars and hoping a willingness to come up to Cal and collaborate <laughs> with us. On a Pac-12 season, <laughs> where we could really use just some additional insight, I you mean, know? Yeah, remember when like Washington hired uh, Tedford. Tedford as like their offensive consultant? Hell yes, I remember that. Yeah, why not Maybe. do that? Why not do that? Hire him as an offensive consultant. One thousand percent, I would love to do that. Oh, I don't know. He seems like a class act. I don't think he would give up SC's information, but do I think he'd be helpful and? In- Scouting some different opponents. Sure, you can tell him to take oh, a, yeah. take the week off in the SC game, but all the other weeks he can come in and help in the office. Yeah, sure, and maybe throw some under the tables advice. Yeah, so, SC. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here's what Garam Harrell likes to run on third and eight. Uh, it would help, but I think that's our little spiel on Clay Elton. Happy trails, my friend. Happy trails. Happy trails. Happy trails. We'll be keeping an eye out for uh, what SC does for the rest of the season. It's going to be very, very interesting. But we continue because we got to talk about our Bears. You ready to talk about this game, Andy? Yeah. About as ready as you can possibly be, right? I guess so. All right. Let's talk about this. All right. Cal, TCU in Fort Worth, Texas at Ammon G. Carter Stadium. Cal loses 32 to 34. The Bears, uh, of course, all of a sudden 
found a long-range passing attack. Chase Garber, 16 of 27, no interceptions, 309 yards, two touchdowns, and a long of 68. Trevin Clark receiving five targets, two catches, 122 yards, and one touchdown. Nico Remigio, uh, three catches. Jake Ton, just three catches. The ball was thrown everywhere, right? And on the ground, your boy, Damian Wilmore, 14 carries, 71 yards, two touchdowns, an average of 5.1 yards per carry. And on the defensive side, the Bears, led by Evan Tattersall, eight total tackles on the day. But, man, tackles, not good. Not good today. Cam Good, of course, I think was the best player on the defensive side. Two sacks, three tackles for loss, five tackles, uh, and one QB hurry. The man played out of his absolute mind. coming, And he's a Texas kid, too. So, you know, homecoming did a lot. The Bears jumped out to a, a fairly good uh, lead going into halftime. But they went for it on fourth down uh, in, in the red zone. They turned it over on downs. Then they tried to make up for that by going for a two-point conversion when they scored a touchdown. Didn't do that. They went for a PAT. It was a bad snap, and they didn't didn't get the points there. Then they went for another second down or two-point conversion, but then a false start pulled them back, so they were going to kick, but then there was an offside by TCU, so they moved the ball back forward, and then the Bears decided to go for two again, but was denied. And at the end of the game, they get the touchdown, They need two to tie it, and it doesn't get into the end zone. And so the Bears leave points on the board. They're chasing the two-point conversion the entire game, and despite despite scoring the same amount of touchdowns as TCU, lose by two points. And that is where we're at. You are muted, my friend. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. I'm going to leave that on there. I think that's hilarious. Damn it. Let's start with the last play of the game. Ish. Not the last play of the game. Sure. Last scoring Cal drive of the game. Okay. As I read on Right for California Live, Garbers, I know who wrote this tweet, Shades of Stanford on the rollout scores a touchdown. Yeah. All right. It is reviewed and moved to the one half yard line. Yeah. Bro, riddle me this. That was targeting. That tackle on Chase? How the hell was that not targeting? Leading with the head, and it made there was helmet tema contact. That's I, it was leading with the head to the high shoulder low helmet. I was stunned. We just, they just glossed over it. I was like, what? It was a clear targeting. Very clear. That was That's news to me. I didn't even notice that. I did not notice that at all. So, which is crazy because that, that I mean, that's, that's why, like, it's cool to have different people watch the game because I didn't notice that at all. I was watching that. I was watching that game with Avi and Twist and Hook here at my house, and none of us saw that. But it's, it's, it's cool that you picked that up. So what? So you saw the defender when he's going to tackle Chase, helmet helmet contact. I'm almost tempted to screen share and <laughs> see if I can show you it live. So yes, I can do that. This is great. This will be a first on the pod. So let's go ahead and pull this up so you can do a live. We'll do a live analysis interpretation as we watch this. Yeah, let's just see if you think this is targeting. So I mean. I thought it was pretty clear uh, that he sort of launched in love with the head. Okay. I, you know, if you didn't see it, I'm sort of doubting myself a little bit. But, you know, for me, it was, uh, it felt, it felt like it was pretty clear. So let me just see. I'm sure it's I any can... of those highlight links, right? You, it would have to be in any of those highlight links. Yeah, it's just the, the there's a ten minute one, and <laughs> oh here it is. Okay, perfect. So hopefully everyone's not hearing that ad. So Can you just kill the kill here. the volume on there. Just hit the volume mute. There you go. Great. All right. So as we're waiting, um, 
I forgot to go over some of the TCU stuff because Max Duggan actually played a really good game, and there's a reason he's he's this these this decently high three touchdowns, seventeen of thirty one, one interception, two hundred thirty four yards, a long forty five. But uh, all right. All right. All right. We have the play up. I did. Okay. All right. Play for me a little bit. Full screen. We'll go in real time. We'll do the replay. Okay. Chase Garber's on the bootleg. Here you go. Ooh. Close. It's close. I will say that. It is close. Ooh. Maybe it was shoulder shoulder. Maybe it was shoulder shoulder. I mean, okay. Watch this one. This one we'll see. He leads with the head. Dude. That's targeting. He, I'm he's telling you that's targeting. <laughs> he leaves with the head, but the first thing that makes contact is his left shoulder. And Does I think it that, matter if it goes helmet to helmet? Well, if they're not looking, see that. But if you, I don't think that's helmet to helmet. Oh. I don't think his helmet hits. I don't think his helmet hits. That's not the view you want, because you want the side view so it'll show the the separation between. We're going super slow mo right now. Okay. You don't think that hit right there? I don't. That's, I don't think his helmet hits, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll go to, go back a little bit. Go back to the go back to the uh, the side view. Okay, okay. Because I think that's where we'll see where they're separate. Where the, if there's separation, not that one. There's one more. There's one more angle that if you play through, we'll show. Okay, we're doing this live on the air. Okay, right here. It's so fast. It is. We'll go slow mo. Okay. Just use the space bar. Just go space bar. Deep, 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 deep. <laughs> right there. See? No contact on the helmet. I think it's shoulder to shoulder. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. I would have at least appreciated a review. I I think looking at it now, I probably would have appreciated a review. I mean, this angle. Right, but what I'm saying with this angle is that because it's from the it does it, I get you, his elbow might hit him. No, no, because it's because it's from the goal line. We have no depth perception, so we can't tell if there's any space between the two helmets, right? Because it's a flattened it's a flattened picture. So the only reason why I bring that up, okay. We continue. I guess it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but if it was ruled a touchdown and then it was targeting, does it change anything on the two point conversion? Well, I mean that if he's targeting, if that's targeting and he's ejected, that's their best cornerback, uh, Hodges Tomlinson, who is I believe Ladanian Tomlinson's cousin. Uh, he would be out of the game, which means their number one corner would be out of the game. That yeah. does change that does change the what you might excuse me, what you might think to do in that position. I think that's a valid point. I think that's an absolutely valid point. If it became targeting. It was a very interesting play to see that. And then you have the following play. Okay, Damian Morgan's the end zone. And I saw this live. Two point conversion. I thought he was in. I also will highlight the Christopher Brooks play on fourth down when they ruled him short. Yeah. I it also looks like a first down. Terrible spot in my opinion. I thought it was a terrible spot. It was a really bad spot. Yeah. And they didn't didn't they didn't review that either. They didn't review that one either. Although it's considered a turnover. So there's a it's it is it is questionable. I mean, I don't know if they can review the the spot. I think a spot is you have to it's it's a weird thing to be because you can't challenge in college football. So you can't challenge the spot, but the, I do, I will say the, the Damian Mora one was like, initially it looked like he didn't get it or, and then, or it looked like he got it. But for me, the more I watched the, the replay on that, the more I feel like his knee was down before the ball crossed the plane, but there's also no definitive angle that shows the ball crossing the plane. Cause it show it, you have the clear cut goal line view where you see where his knee hits, but you don't see like at, like how far the ball is forward, depth perception once again. Yeah. And there's no sideline view that shows 
where the ball crossed the plane and his knee. What we need done. is we need Josh. I don't know if you guys know this, Josh, who we have a friend of the pod and writer for right for California is on, was doing work with the major league baseball on the replay. And he sets up the cameras on the actual basis. So we need that. Oh, so we need Josh to do that for the pylon. <laughs> it's ridiculous. How is it? How is it possible you don't have the angle? To me, it looks pretty clear that I don't know. The announcers seem to be positive that his knee was down and it was short. And I was like, "There's no way you're positive." No. Also, those announcers were like our age, and they were hot garbage. <laughs> they were really bad. They were <laughs> they were absolutely horrendous. And I'm not I'm not I'm not even afraid to like rip them. Because they seemed so underprepared for this game, did not know players, did not know like, yeah, it was, oh, oh my god. My favorite was um, on the so the play that that we were talking about before we started to record was the third down and two play. Yeah, and on the third and two play, they throw the ball up, you know, to Kakoa, and it's you know quote unquote intercepted, and it was like obviously dropped yeah (laughs) and while they're convincing themselves that it was an interception they also called him like davis yeah (laughs) and i was like who the hell are you talking about (laughs) and they did it like multiple times they're like yeah just davis like who who is davis i was like am i watching the right game right now like who's who are you guys what? There was also there was also a moment where the announcers were like Chase Garber's one of the best quarterbacks Cal has ever seen, and I was like, I, I mean, I think Chase is Chase isn't bad. Chase is Chase is like not not terrible. Like, but he's he's got a long ways to go before he enters the pantheon of of Cal quarterback greats. Like, does this does this do these guys like not understand that we've had two number one overall quarterback picks taken in NFL history? We also have arguably one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever throw the ball in NFL history. And we have multiple quarterbacks that were drafted, <laughs> not in the first, uh, in the first round as well, but also in other points of the draft throughout NFL history. <laughs> like I could, I could list at least 10, I think on that list before chase gets to that conversation. In my opinion. Yeah. So it was, I was like, dude, man, like you're just throwing out superlatives at this point. <laughs> like you're just, <laughs> you're just throwing out like, oh, Mr. Mr. Fantastic of Cal. Like, and just throwing out as many like superlative things you can possibly throw out there. Just to, just to put things from names. They were reaching. <laughs> reaching. They were reaching. If anything, they were so- Mr. Fantastic. They were reaching for long, long points. So the one thing I, I'm going to keep jumping around here. All right. We're going to keep going. So we're gonna keep that's jumping. where we went. So we started with that. Okay. You know, sort of the end of that. All right. I think there's frustration baked into the final two drives. It, it, one of the themes that we absolutely will come back to, I think, is just to take let's take a long look defensively at the arm tackles, yeah. the missed tackles, yep. the bad, you know, bad, like basically like breaks towards the football and, you know, the fact that on the, the biggest play of the game that TCU's quarterback escaped two different tackles and was able to get the first down and, bit and, and end the game. Um, and and then also having watched, I think, the Tim DeRoyter defense at Oregon and what they looked like in comparison to what Cal looks like right now, is there is a stark difference between those two. There is. And it's a concerning one. But the play where we lost this game, and I'll tell this, to anybody who listens and probably 95% of the people know this. We lost this game with 16 seconds left in the second quarter. That's it. That's where the game was lost. And it it's that simple. You cannot give away six. You can't. With 16 seconds left on a run. You can't. You just can't do it. You don't do it on the road. You never make it up. It's it's just too hard. And we see it right here. We lost that. The second that happened, I was like, we're going to lose this game. That's it. I knew it when we were on the, when I was on the team in 09. And you can see it as it is now. You make these stupid plays like that. And it's impossible to recover from. Because situationally, it, it completely changes the dynamic of the football game. 
And I think Avi had that stat about Wilcox's record when the first team that scores 21. Yep. And, you know, that is pretty substantive. Like, there's, it's pretty impressive. Um, not in a great way. So, uh, but that was it for me. And, yeah, that guy's a beast. Yep. <laughs> He's super good. Yep. But, come on. Defense is, that's, that's supposed to be, you know, the bread and butter for us. Well, I want to share this quote with you as, as we're talking about the, the coaching stuff, right? I want to... Uh, Coach Wilcox had a press conference today, and Trace Travers, our, a friend of ours and also of Cal Rivals, uh, did ask him about the tackling, and here's what he had to say. If if this isn't recorded, uh, I will pull the recording and put it into the podcast. Yeah, I mean, all, all the above. I mean, especially later in the game, we, we uh, as the game wore on, we missed more and more tackles. Um, you know, all those things are going to play into it. Angles, uh, technique, um, you know, there's an ability matchup portion of that sometimes, and we got to do a better job getting our body on people and finish them all the way to the ground. And when they're, you're going against a talented guy, which we're going to see talented players each and every week, um, you know, it takes effort, want to, technique, angles, takes all that to get the guy on the ground. And we got to do a better job of that because there were some routine plays when into the half, you know, they ran inside zone and we misplayed it on the edge and then it, we missed a number of tackles. I mean, you can't have inside zone go for 50 and a touchdown. That's just unacceptable and same on a curl route uh, i think later in the game just things that should not be going for touchdowns uh you know, we got a lot of work to do there we're driven by the search for better but when it comes to hiring the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all don't search match with indeed indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. I know my curl route. It was my cousin. (laughs) Quentin Johnston, dude. My cousin showed out on us. <laughs> it was a big problem. Uh, I don't think he understood my pregame text message. <laughs> but um, that's probably one of the better Wilcox quotes in a long time. I think it's like as honest as he's mm-hmm. as he's been. I mean, he, he's better usually in these press conferences than uh, the post game. Yeah. But here's the thing that that he talks about and he's spot on with it so i'm super confident they'll get it corrected but here's the thing that i noticed is that when we came in to kind of correct the sunny dykes defensive old one of the things that i felt like we really did a good job of and you would always point this out is we would stand the guy up and then wait for help to come Mm -hmm. and we would always like it was like we had that swarm Mm -hmm. and i feel like we're we've lost it we don't have the swarm anymore where we have guys going for the single, the solo arm tackle instead of like holding, like trying to hold the run more. So hold the runner up and wait for help. And that to me is a huge difference in watching this team versus defenses of old. And I think that's sort of what I saw with Tim DeRoyter, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts. I think you're right to a certain degree uh, because I agree with most of those points that we don't swarm to the ball as as more this year and maybe a little bit last year too. I'd have to go back and look at some of the tape last year. Probably the UCLA game and probably the, the Oregon State game. I mean, once again, there's extenuating circumstances to those games, but I mean, habits habits are habits are easily seen. So I think I think that's an absolute valid point. The the thing that the thing that doesn't sit right with me a little bit is you see all the people talking about how we missed Reuter 
Like the the defense has gotten to shit after De- like we let DeRoyter go. Um and maybe from a like a schematic standpoint and a play calling standpoint, maybe it's not as good as it was. Maybe they're not as uh aware or a little bit more predictive of what the offense is going to do as with DeRoyter. Maybe that's one of DeRoyter's strengths. Maybe he was one of those guys that are able to to get a pulse on the flow of the game a bit better than Sermon is. And that's not a negative on Sermon. That's just a positive of the writers, right? It's just a, maybe it's an innate skill that he has. But the issue stems with me is that not everything went wrong just because the Reuter left. Because you still look at this defense and most of these guys that you have in terms of name guys, right? In terms of experience are guys that have been here three, four, five, six Seven, if you include Luke Beckett, like they've been here for years now. Like, and it's not that the younger guys that these new coaches are coaching up are the ones that are making these mistakes. It's the older guys that have been here for a lot longer, right? That aren't, that are making these mistakes. So where does that come from? Because it's not a, it's not a habit issue because they've taught these guys this, the techniques of coaching and or of, of tackling and all of that stuff for years now. So the only other the only other thing that comes to mind is the play calling and maybe the preparation. And the one question that I never got to ask any of the DBs last week after the Nevada State game um was because I mean we didn't get any of the DBs in the post game, which I was kind of upset about. I kind of wanted one of the DBs. But the question I wanted to ask was did you guys feel like they were taking shots down the field when you guys weren't expecting it? Because the reason I want to know the answer to that question is that because that means that the play call is expecting, let's say, a run, right? Because that team's not an RPO team. Like that, the Nevada team was a straight up, like if they're running, they're running. If they're passing, they're passing. And then play action. Like it's not, they're, they weren't doing RPOs like TCU was, right? You TCU, you legit had to prep for both the run and the pass in every single given play. Um, But for the Nevada game, like that was the big thing is that it felt sometimes that the DBs weren't necessarily sure or were taken by surprise when they took their deep shots and they got rolled on some of those plays. Whereas TCU, I think they felt it looked a bit, uh, they were a little bit more comfortable. They looked like they knew where the, where the ball was going. They knew where it was. It's just those individual plays weren't made and you talk you listen to Wilcox talk about it and he talks about the inside zone route they set the edge wrong that's one guy's mistake which crumbles the entire process of how that defense is supposed to collapse on that play because it becomes a broken play right because the guy bounces it outside the edge isn't there and all these guys who are funneling inside to get the play down now have to scramble in different I mean that's not an excuse those guys still need to make the play but once again, you don't know what happens in a broken play. It's like a scramble drill. Like whatever happens in a scramble drill, like that's you have to make those plays, but at the same time, like everyone's improvising. So you just don't know what will happen. Yeah, well said. I don't know. There's a lot being thrown at Sermon, and it's just tough to say. Once again, I'm just gonna continue to say it. Yeah, you know, everyone's gonna be tired of it. Wait four games. <laughs> just let's let's wait four games. Two games is not enough, and it's just not. And we can pair it back to last year. I just think like when people talk, like I've seen some tweets like, oh, one in five since we thought Cal was taking a turn for the better. Yeah, okay. But you cannot count 2020 as some sort of reality. <laughs> it just wasn't. Like, it's ridiculous to me that we count any of those games. I barely even count that we beat Oregon. Yeah. It doesn't matter. That's, that was not real football. It wasn't a real season. It wasn't real football. It just wasn't it. So you go back. You can go back to that as much as you want. Cal's 0-2. That's it. They're 0-2. Great. They played two close games. You could easily be 2-0. and Yep. Coin flip games. And one of them they were significant underdogs on, and they over they had a shot to win that game. And the other one they, you know, were slight the slightest of favorites in. And they had a shot to win that game, they lost. 
So odds are there'll be some regression on the luck factor. And as long as we can control what, you know, I think our special teams is concerning. <laughs> uh, but if we can fix the things that you see, that I and we know that our staff is seeing, we'll... There's not a single team in the Pac-12, including Oregon, that I look at and say is a loss. Not one. Not a single opponent on our entire schedule that I look at and say is a loss. That's the first time I've said that in 10 years. Yeah. Every team looks beatable in some form or fashion. Like there are weaknesses to exploit in every single team. If anyone's looking at Oregon saying, oh, Oregon looks so good. Yeah, how they look against Fresno State. I mean, even exactly. Ohio State, too. That was a closer game than people think it was. Like, the, the box yep. score doesn't doesn't put the, like, show how close of a game it, it got towards the end. I thought Ohio State was going to tie yep. it up and then Stroud through that yep. pick. But I thought, you know, I expected them to to tie that up. But they play, Oregon played great. But th- it's not, it's not, it, it's, it's the thing, it's like, the Pac-12 is up for grabs. The Pac-12 isn't as bad as everybody says it is in comparison to what else is out there. We know this to be true. We know that's true. So it's just that in our heads, I think we've created this. We've had the past. The historicals are not in our favor, just like you said. So going into this Pac-12, Pac-12 season, we're thinking that this is going to be the Cal team of old that goes against the gauntlet that is what UW. SC, a good Stanford, and now a seemingly good UCLA. It's not that. That's not it. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't it. That's not what's happened. That's not this season. This team can easily have a winning record in Pac-12 play. So I think we just need to chill. I really hope Sacramento State is just like a nice... I love Troy Taylor. So that's... You know, I don't want him to see, see him get destroyed but yeah like we kind of need it we kind of need a 40 to 7 game yep. and or even 35 7 doesn't have to be that high scoring 35 7 just nice nice and easy where you know we get that confidence back and we go play a washington team that looks absolutely dreadful <laughs> <laughs> it's i I don't know what else to say. Like I think you you nailed the point on the head. It's it's that this it still looks winnable. It's <laughs> the, the Pac-12 North is still up for grabs. Like you just have to knock it out in Pac-12 play, and you could still win the Pac-12 North. Like it's 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 crazy, but that's exactly where we are. I mean, we could lose. We could literally lose against Sacramento State. Fan base up in arms. My goodness, yeah. this is the end. We could literally run the table and pack twelve play, <laughs> without a doubt. It's that wide open. As our as our uh, favorite quarterback, Aaron Rodgers would say, "Relax." <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's not saying that uh, right now. <laughs> yeah, he didn't look too great uh, against uh, New Orleans. But anyways, uh, so we talked about the defense. All right, we've been jumping around. We talk about the passing game for a little bit because, my goodness. Like, they just came out guns firing. Like, PFF grades, not a big fan of in terms of, like, how it's graded. But it's easy, It's nice to see in relative terms to your own team in terms of how they progress week in and week out. All right. PFF pass grade for Cal against Nevada, 55.9. All right. And just to put it in perspective, what do you think Cal's passing game was rated at for the TCU game? You've had Wendy's Nugs dipped in sauce, but have you had them covered in sauce? Wendy's new Saucy Nugs. Take the crispy and spicy nugs you love and turn them up to 11. Choose between flavors like buffalo or honey barbecue, garlic parm, or if you're a real heat seeker out there, you can try spicy ghost pepper only on Wendy's signature spicy nugs. Listen, I'm going to dare you to do it. I dare you. That's seven delicious ways to try the nugs that you already love. Pick a flavor, grab some extra napkins, and then grab a few more napkins and prepare to nug like you've never nugged before. For a whole new way to nug, 
It's got to be Wendy's at participating U.S. Wendy's. 86.3. 91.8. Like, that's how drastic of, of a passing game difference this was. Like, you look at you look at Chase and like where he was throwing, what he was doing. Um, it's it was it's pretty incredible. Like he was not great uh, throwing left for sure, but anything down the middle or anything to the right, the dude, the dude was on fire, right? Uh, what's it between the numbers downfield? Three of three, 159 yards. Uh, outside right, two of two, 82 yards and a touchdown. Right. Middle between the numbers, three of seven, 35 yards and a touchdown. Middle short, four of four, 14 yards. Like middle right, two of two, eight yards. Like he was, he was just deep balling left and right. And the, and not only that, the offensive line in terms of their pass protection, Wilcox said in that press conference that we were listening to, he said this was probably one of the best pass passing game or pass protection performances we've had. And it shows he was kept clean 68.8% of the time. He wasn't blitzed 75% of the time. Like that's how, that's how well they were doing. Like they blitzed 25%, but even then he was seven to four when he was blitzed. And we all know that the chase that where he's better under pressure than he is with a clean pocket. But yet in this game in a clean pocket, the dude was dishing. Left and right. No screen passes, right? 96.9% of the passes weren't screen passes. And they went no play action. Only 31% was play action. 68.8% of the plays were actual pass plays. And that's when he was graded the highest. 91.6 offense. 92.6 in terms of uh, the passing game. He was... I mean, this, this is... I mean... I'm I'm still at like a loss of words, right? I think you would said it, you said it best. This kind of feels like the old miss game. This had the feels of the old miss game, like early on in the game. It had those feels. It was like the the North Texas game that we talked about last week was like the Nevada game, except we lost it, and then we came into this game and it felt like the old miss game, but then we ended up losing. I mean, old miss too. We almost lost at the end of the game, right? And that's pretty much what happened here. But man, it's hard. It's hard to win on the road. It is, and that's. It's hard to win on the road, and it's ha- even harder to win on on the road at a conference. And, but yeah, the offense played really well. Chase played really well. And but the, then I, does it also? Do you also question why? Why all of a sudden we, we played? We like started throwing deep and all that. Yeah, I do. Was it just that they weren't playing cover two? <laughs> <laughs> so, fun fun little thing. If you go back and listen to the TCU uh, preview pod that I did with Jamie uh, from Frogs of War, he does talk about Gary Patterson's four two five defense and how how it's structured, right? And what he says is, when the defense it's called, it's three separate plays that gets called in. The first play is for the f- the front six guys. The second play is for the right side of the field, split down the middle for the corners and DBs on that side. And a third play is called for the other side of the field with those DBs and corners or the corner safety or however many people are in that in that space. So maybe it is they figured out how to beat it and which was go over the top and go over the top early. And force them to be confused because we did not go deep at all in the first game. And you saw like Travion Beck like tweeting out about it, right? He's like, finally, <laughs> we're throwing deep and we're connecting on all, with all these guys. Um, I think it was a. Uh, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, let me let me turn around the question on you then. All right. Which offense do you think is our real offense? Is it the one we saw against Nevada? Or is it this one that we saw against TCU? It's probably closer to the one against TCU. 
than it is Nevada. But the one that I actually hope that it really ends up becoming is one that is run first. <laughs> like, I think Damian Moore is so good. He is. And I hate that he only got 14 carries. The guy has averaged like five to six yards per carry in the first couple of games. Give him the damn ball more often and play more of the Wisconsin style offense you want to run. Ball control. Be be more of a Stanford than than what we're trying to be right now. Uh and give our time to just give our defense time to just breathe. <laughs> but um yeah, I it probably closer to TCU because I think that the defenses we'll play will be, look more like TCU than they will look like Nevada. Nevada just schemed us up pretty good, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- we'll find out in the next couple of games. What about you? I think it's closer to TCU, and I'm saying that as a person who watched them practice for two weeks. The stuff I saw them practice and the stuff I saw them do is definitely closer to TCU than it is to Nevada. The one thing I will say is like the the like the the line between the two is that we barely saw any play action here. We barely saw any play action last game against Nevada. Like these were straight passes. The Nevada game, it was like in at least in the first quarter and two, it was like straight run, right? And then we tried to go pass and it just sputtered. But there has to be that like gray area in between where we kind of reach, where we kind of use play action to go long and, and start to do all those other pass concepts. I think that's coming. Whether that comes against Sacramento State, I don't know, but I, I feel like it's coming. And that's when we'll see like the culmination of the offense. Um, but as of right now, like, yeah, definitely closer to TCU. We have the weapons. Chase is throwing the ball faster. He's making his reads better. And if you if you weren't sure if Chase is making his reads on offense, you clearly know he's making his reads now. Damn, was I glad I said I kept with the I won't bet against Chase again. <laughs> Whew, thank goodness for that. <laughs> the here the yeah. one question I uh I have for you, right? I'm looking at the PFF stats. I'm looking at the stat counts. All right. How many total pass catching Players, skill position players. So that includes wide receivers, tight ends, running backs. How many total players do you think played or was targeted in the pass game? Like they played pass snaps. You asked this question as if I would know the I answer. Mean, I, my name is not Trace Travers. You know I mean, this, you right? A, you know you that my jab. name is not. Jab. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, we know that only five wide receivers played on mm-hmm. offense. Um, I know that Jermaine Terry got sn- got some play. We know Ton just played at least seven. And then, did you include running backs mm-hmm. in that? I think yep. you did. There's four, three, twelve. Close ten. Which is which is actually surprising, because if you go back. And you look at our game against Nevada. How many players do you think was in that one? You just had to throw the second one in there, didn't you? Well, based on my, I don't know, five, six, (laughs) ten. Okay. But here's the difference, right? We played more wide receivers in that game. Played Nico, Monroe Young, Cole Crawford, Jermaine. Jeremiah Hunter, Trayvon Clark. Those were the those were the wide receivers. Versus this game, which was more tight ends, right? Colin Moore, Jake Tonjes. We saw Jermaine Terry, although he wasn't in any pass routes and he got called for a foul or a penalty. But the wide receiver slightly changed in this one. It was Nico, Justin Baker, Kiko Crawford, Jeremiah Hunter, Trayvon Clark. Now, common denominator between the two. We used a lot more route runners in the Nevada game. Guys who are better with their feet, guys who are good out of their breaks, guys who aren't necessarily going to beat you with speed, but more possession, right? But you look at this this group of wide receivers, all speed. Nico, Baker, Crawford, Hunter, Trayvon, all speed guys. 
and we went full speed. And what did we do? We threw deep. These guys beat the other D the TCU DBs with speed, with chunk plays after chunk plays after chunk plays after chunk plays. I'm actually surprised that we didn't throw like a a 70 yard touchdown. Like we'd get like 48, 65, but we never like got like that huge, huge touchdown pass. Mm-hmm. But I mean, that's the one that surprises me is that I feel like. Are they picking their personnel and who's playing in plays based on who they're going to be playing and the type of defenses they're going to be playing? We're not just throwing out the same type of offense week in, week out with the same like players on the depth chart week in, week out. Because now, if this is actually, if this is how it trends, it's going to get harder and harder for Pac 12 teams to actually prep for us as the season progresses. Because there's going to be more and more tape, but there's going to be more and more diversity. And you don't know which team and what type of like personnel groupings you're going to get from this Cal offense moving forward. And that's kind of optimistic. That gives me a little hope. And I think it proves also my point that the Nevada game was, they felt like these set of plays could probably win them that game against Nevada. It backfired. They came into the TCU game kind of with that same mentality. These plays, with the scouting that we've done and the prepping that we've done, can beat Nevada, can beat TCU. It did. It honestly did. We just, I mean, luck of the draw, we just couldn't convert on a couple of conversions and a couple of PATs, and our defense just couldn't tackle. Both those, yeah, I mean, both the, the ideas themselves aren't wrong. It's just way overconfident. It is. Like the Nevada yeah. one. It's just like, who are if you it is that If that is the case, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but the last thing I kind of want to run by you is a lot of people are upset, and I think some people are probably on the precipice of calling for a coaching change. I'm I guess. sure, but people already have. And I want to just talk about Gary Patterson. Gary Patterson has been coaching at TCU for 21 yep. years. Right? 21 Something years. like that. And I'm just going to talk about his Big 12 conference record. Sure. Seven and six, 2012, okay. four and five in conference. They lost the Buffalo Wild Wings Bowl. It's a sad one to lose. <laughs> it is. Four and eight the next year, two and seven in conference, tied for seventh. Okay. So that's a tough season, yeah. right? I'm sure people were clamoring for his job yep. then, too. 12 and one, eight and one in conference, second in the Big 12, and they go to the Peach Bowl. It was at the time a New Year's Six yeah. Bowl. Then eleven and two, they go to the Alamo mm-hmm. Bowl. They tied for second. Seven and two, so eight and one in conference, seven and two in conference big, in the Big Twelve. When the Big Twelve was good. Then six and seven, four and five, fifth. Then eleven and three, seven and two in conference, second. Go back to the Alamo. When they were six and seven, they got into the Liberty Bowl, so they still were bowl yep. eligible. Seven and six, four and five, tied for fifth. What bowl? Cheese it bowl. Cheese it bowl. Exactly. 2019, five, seven, three and six in conference, tied for seventh. 2020, six and four, five and four in conference, six. They got into the Texas Bowl, which I didn't know. I was did not know that existed. And this year they're two and oh. <sighs> I think people won't like this take, but I kind of look at that as like we're even with this team, with this coach that has a pretty f- similar vibe mm-hmm. to Wilcox. If you gave me even what we have here, we're looking at nine years of that. It's not all glory. It just isn't. There's tough seasons. There's five and seven seasons. There's six and seven seasons. There's four and eight. There's a four and eight season. There's three and six, four and five. Like, you know, there's one, two, three, nearly four. You know, your five and four is the last year to get out of that. Four out of five years, you could, or I guess you're going to say three out of five years, you have a losing conference record and barely on one of those. But yet they're going to bowl games every year and they just got a five-star recruit. To me, the TCU model 
and you go and look at Wilcox, five and seven, two and seven, seven and six, four and five, eight and five, four and five. I literally am not counting 2020. One and three, one and three. Oh and two. We'll see what happens. If we happen to go four and eight this year, I'm not going to be calling for anything. I'm just not. This shit takes too long to build. You have no idea what the next season's going to be. We just don't. 12 and 1 TCU 2014 after 4 and 8 2 and 7 in conference. We cannot lose faith, especially with I think the one miracle hire that we magically got right at a time when we didn't deserve to get it right. So, that's my sunshine pumping. I'm still on the Wilcox train. We can't overlook opponents. We are doing that. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. We made some changes at def- on a D coordinator. We went for rec- you know someone that two guys that are better recruiters or have let's just say like have better records and histories as recruiters than maybe coaches. So we might be seeing a little bit of that. It'll balance itself out. No, I think you're right. What we can't do as a fan, fan base is overreact to the roller coasters of college football and all of a sudden be calling for a change because what else is out there? Are we going to be SC? Well, I I mean, golf clap <laughs> first because I think that was poignantly said. I think the, the, the follow-up I would say to that is, one, I think we first have to acknowledge we're not a powerhouse program, right? We got to get that out of our mindset first. We're not an LSU. We're not an Alabama. Like we're not a Clemson. Like we're not, we're, we're not a Notre Dame. We're not an SC. We're not a Texas. Like we're not, we're not that, that, those types of schools at all, right? So get that out of out of your head first, right? Sure, maybe vying for a championship it comes down the road, but as of right now, it isn't, because the biggest thing that those teams have in common is that they have the infrastructure built to have a successful football team that vies for national championships. We don't have that yet. We don't have we don't have the money first of all that competes with those schools in terms of recruiting um, tools, right? Facilities, like we just don't have that. Plus, we have academic restrictions that are put on us. We have um, other limiting factors, right? Beyond our thing. Fifth thing is, and it also ties back to the money. As absurd as it is with coaches. Uh, contracts these days we just don't have the money to keep a hold of the most talented coaches with in our program we just don't so we have to set the expectation of all right maybe we can get to that point at some point but if you can't be willing to not sacrifice things to get to that point like point case in point right tedford brought us took us to some places that we never i that was my first foray into college football. So my expectation for college football and Cal football was at an all-time high. But I would assume that some of the older guys would say Tedford took us to some heights that they didn't think the Cal football team, right, as a program, would be able to reach. Flip side of that is they sh- he shot the academic side of the program down to the ground, and we had to rebuild that part up. So you can't be like, yeah, we're the best public institute in America and also want – you know, college football to be the best because it just doesn't work. Recruiting doesn't work that way. The finances doesn't work that way. And you you can't have both. It's not possible. It's in a utopian world. Sure, it'd be great if we had both. But I'm going to be the realist here and I'm going to shatter a lot of worlds for people. It's not possible in the current state and how college football is run these days. It just it's it's not possible. So if that's the case, then what is the expectation that you're setting on yourself? And what do you want out of this Cal program? Does it bring you joy just to watch Cal football and your alma mater play every week? Sure. I think that's a baseline for everyone. The second thing is you just want su- you just want to see success. What does that success entail? Is the expectation being set to win the Pac-12 every year? Like are we in Oregon or an SC? If we want to get there, people got to start donating money and we just got to start building our finance pool a little bit bigger to be able to support these coaches and the facilities for these players in recruiting. We're not going to do that if people are unwilling to to donate to the program. And if you want to donate to the program or don't, that's totally up to you. But I'm just saying as a general concept, the amount of money that donors pour into some of these bigger football programs and the reason that they're able to fire Helton at a time like this is because they have the finances to probably back up and go get 
a name brand coach that's probably, you know, a bigger, shinier object to be the face of the program. We don't have that, right? So I think that's, so all in all, to tie that all up, we get to this point now where people are getting upset at Wilcox and wanting a, a coaching change. And it goes back to your point. What's out there that's better that we can do? Wh- which, co- I mean, there people are going to say, oh, we can go after Peterson. No, I mean, that's a pipe dream. That's never going to happen. We don't have the money to pay for his contract, right? What We're going to have to go after another up-and-coming coach. Like, people would have said P.J. Fleck a couple years ago. We can't, I don't think we can afford P.J. Fleck anymore. <laughs> I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's possible. So you're going to have to go after another coordinator, an up-and-coming coordinator, who is going to have growing pains as his first-time head coach. And then if he doesn't succeed and get to the point where fans want him to, we're going to fire him. That's the exact trajectory that we just have with Wilcox right now. Yeah. Like, we have to, we have right. to see this through one way or another. I mean, and I don't know if this season is the see it through season, is what I'm saying. It's the we need more time. Yeah, I really I agree. I agree. I mean, I think it's I think it's one of the. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think I would just take a long term lens. And the last piece, something that you said that really brought this up in my mind. I brought up a different point in my mind was the people that are talking about, uh, you know, the decision to go to sermon and as if that was the reason why, you know, the relationship fractured with Tim DeRoyter and he left. I, you know, I can't be a hundred percent certain. I'm like 90% certain Tim DeRoyter every single year that he was with our program was looking to make a move to back to go to go back to head coaching. Yep. Every single year. That was abundantly clear. His name was linked to a lot of jobs. Like that's that's the backup. And what happened at Oregon was the previous D coordinator, who now I'm blanking on his name. Uh uh shoot. Uh Avalos? Andy Avalos? It's at Boise yeah, State. He's the yeah. Boise State head coach now. So he went there and he was a hot commodity after one year of success there. And I guarantee you, DeRoyter looked at that role and said, Oregon's got the national spotlight. I'm going to be able to move from step from point A to point B much easier at Oregon than at Cal. I think the stuff about play calling is overblown. The stuff about Wilcox bringing in a friend is overblown. It's the, it was a move. It was a risk mitigation move. So if there's drop off between talent, fine. It's risk mitigation. You're going for the long term sustainable option versus someone who's looking at it with the short term lens. And that's exactly what I think you're talking about, Rob. Is what do we get with the short term lens right now? Chris Peterson's the only name you put out there where I get I get I get Urban Meyer. I'm not Urban Meyer. Yeah, but like, I mean, but that's, like but that's what cow. I mean. There's there's a couple of names out there that you would say, <laughs> but yeah, you, my, you, you, I digress. Your point continues. But what you the other side of this is Mark Fox, guys. <laughs> it's right here. It's we don't have to look far enough to see what that looks like. It's Mark Fox. It's a retreader. You really want to go right now and or at the end of the season and give our current AD the chance to hire a football coach after he hired Mark Fox with a search committee? Are you kidding me? Are, give me the guy that's gone to give me the guy that sets the expectation at Rose Bowl that's gone to back to back, you know, bowl season. Once again, I'm not counting 2020. That's gone to like bowl, gotten us bowl eligible in you know, seventy five five percent of the seasons in which he could, and or sixty six percent of the the seasons in which he could, and is building the program for the long term. It's not always beautiful on the path to success. There's ups, there's downs, there's shitty seasons, there's good seasons. We're still here with the same quarterback that we've had for the last four years. We have yet to see one of these young guys come up and see if there's a different variety 
of what we can be offered here. Or a player like a Jeremiah Hunter, who you saw make a really big play, step up, or a Damian Moore, who could come into next season as one of the better or best running backs in all of the Pac-12. There's no way in hell I'm disrupting any of this whatsoever for at least two seasons. And if you're coming in tweeting us saying like, hey, can we talk? No, I'm not doing it. I'm not. I probably would have if I was 22. But at this point, like we've been here long enough. We've seen the results. I honestly think as a fan base, we can be better than this. And it's not to say that like anyone's behaving in a bad way. It's just that there's enough data in front of us where we can all just sort of sit here and say like, This is where we're at, and there's a very clear path for us to be successful continuing to do what we do here. And I remember when we lost three games in a row, and uh, I remember turning to Trace, and and it was like everyone on the in in the interwebs in the internet is freaking out. We've lost three games in a row. I look at Trace and he goes, "I still think this team's got it. Just all the confidence in the world." And and there was something with this staff that he never said those type of things with the Texas staff, right? There's something with Wilcox and this staff that gave him that confidence. And that's the confidence that I have. So everyone's like, how do you see seven and five? I still think we got it. I think we have it. This team can still go eight and four. <laughs> like, it's it's still there. It's way too early to hit the alert button. And I, I remember what I said last week. I said, I've opened the button that like nukes everything. And I'm like getting ready to press it. I have now closed that box. I have <laughs> locked it and I have stepped away. I've stepped away. I've seen enough in this in the improvement from week one to week two to believe that it was it was I feel more and more confident that it was the jitters of game one at home with crowds, like and not an actual meaningful football, the pressure of games, right? Of each playing being mattering. I think it just took a toll on a young team, especially because we played so many young guys. I think that's where we're at. But I think that's a that's a good cut to end it. We do have two questions that people have asked, but I will let Andy decide whether we pass on these questions or not because uh, I think we kind of answered them, but I just want to make sure. Uh, Sid sends us a question. She says, are you happy with the play call so far from the coaches? If not, what do you hope changes from a play call perspective? can be answered on both sides of the ball or just overall. Well, of course we're going to answer the question from Sid because shout out Sid, number one fan. Rob, I'm 100% passing that to you. I'm happy with it now. I wasn't happy with it in game one. Um, I mean, there are, there are still moments in game two that, you know, the third and two call, like you're okay with that pass call. I'm not okay with that pass call. I think you should have just run it and gotten and tried to get the first down kept the clock going um and just move move the ball because if i don't want to play the what if game but i am going to play here for a split second if you get that first down the likelihood of that 50 yarder on the inside zone coming back isn't there (laughs) so yeah that's my that's my I would have put that likelihood of that play happening at 0% yeah. anyways, but it yeah. did, and uh, I learned yeah. <laughs> something. So <laughs> It did, and we got to move past it. Uh, but from the defensive side, I don't I don't think I had any issues with the defensive play calling in this game in particular. I think we got pressure on the quarterback. We moved Duggan around. He made some plays. We just could not complete the one-on-one plays um, to get tackles and to get him down, to get the wide receivers down. And I also need to shout out Zach Evans, the five-star running back for TCU, who, good Lord, he's good. <laughs> like, we just got to, we got to tip yeah. the hat at some point, right? Like, his breakaway speed, his elusiveness, his, like, his body balance to be able to shift and curve his runs. My goodness. Like, you know. He's yeah, really good. I'm a he's big, really li- good. yeah. It's like, it's like when we saw Jalen Rager. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that, that's, that's good. good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think defensively it's about execution. It's not mm-hmm. about play call. I, I think it's just about executing the plays. And yeah, that's coaching. But it's also it's also game yeah. experience. So it should get better with time. 
That's the thing to watch. If it doesn't get better with time, then there's concern. But if it gets better from game to game, like you're saying, and I think that's why, you know, there's what we're saying. It's like there was a drastic improvement, not everywhere, but for the most part from Nevada to this week. If we make the same jump again from this week, this past week to Sacramento State, and then we go from Sacramento State and we make another small leap against Washington, you're going to feel way different about this team than, you know, when you're right now Mm -hmm. 0-2. I concur. Uh, last question, uh, Shavit Karen on Twitter. Do you think Wilcox would move on from Sherman if the defense defense continues to decline to being okay rather than the really good slash great we have gotten spoiled with? Uh, feeling any better about Musgrave after TCU? So I think we answered the first question or the second question. We do feel better about Musgrave after TCU. Uh, we do, as we talked about the play calling and so on. Um, but, I mean, this isn't really a question about, like, firing Wilcox. But, I mean, I think it is a valid question to ask. If the defense if the de- defense, if the the defense, defense keeps going, I don't think it's in a downward trend right now. But let's say it does con- let it does go in a downward trend. Do you, do you make that change? Or is it just a, we just kind of mulligan and, and keep going? One, love Shavit. Super engaged on Twitter, so uh, shout out to you. Thanks for the question. Two, uh, I don't know. He's co he's co defensive coordinator mm-hmm. right now. I'd probably be more likely to maybe switch up play quality duties. To Keith Hayward, see if that works. <laughs> you know. Uh, also, news flash. Wait. Okay, he's never not- mind. I don't know if I can say oh. it on there. <laughs> but uh, if there's a potential different elevation in which a certain particular coach can view the field on, then, you know, maybe things get different. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying, he, Andy's basically saying, uh, why don't we try moving other people into the, into the coaching box? <laughs> yes. That's what exactly what I'm saying. But I don't, I just don't know if I, it would have to be a really drastic regression. Like it'd be like the tackling issues persisted all season. Yeah. But I just think like our teams, we've started fast every Wilcox season and now we're starting slow. And I'm actually quite curious to see what the result is of starting slow. I agree. Or if you want to call 2020, the made up season that I don't count and say we started slow there. Well, what did we do? We, we beat went Oregon three and then we beat four. Oregon. And we should have beat Stanford. And we should have beat um, Oregon State. So, you know, like that team, to me, like these are these toss-up games. And you start to win those toss-up games. If you're getting better, that's it. That's the theme of this pod. We're looking for improvement, game over game improvement. If by week four, you're beating Oregon, okay, great. Let's go two and two. We'll beat Sac State. We'll beat Washington. And then the world's our oyster. We got five more games that we're gonna win. I mean, the the last the last question I I threw out there as like a hypothetical. Don't you want to see Justin Martin play in a Cal jersey? Yes, <laughs> I'm just saying. You make that change, that's not happening. He might be the highest rated quarterback we've had in quite some time, and arguably one of the most talented recruits we've brought in at quarterback in quite some time. Don't you want to see what that might look like? I do. Mm. I sure as hell do. I mean, once I mean the 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 other aspect of that is when's the last time we've had an African American quarterback? Oh, well, not that long ago. Devon Monster. True, but long term starter. Reggie Robertson. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's probably it's probably Reggie, unless unless uh he was not Maynard. A long, uh, he was a long time. Maynard. Yeah. Maynard. Maynard. Yeah. Long term Maynard. Yeah. Ten years. I'd like to see some diversity at the quarterback spots. But that's it. That is our pod. Um, last thing before we go, Andy, we always have the victory cannon, which we still have not renamed. Uh but it is the victory cannon for now. Do you have anything to throw into the victory cannon to end the pod? The victory cannon in which we lose. (laughs) 
yeah, today is a super sad day for me personally. Um, I haven't been in a good place all day mentally after learning the passing of Norm McDonald, who was a, a personal friend of mine, my family's, uh, who I got was blessed to know over uh, an extended period of time. Just by chance, I met him playing football of all things, and uh, he became a really good family friend of ours, and I know his entire family uh, pretty well. And um, you know, he is a a, a wonderfully gifted, talented comedian, but all of that pales in comparison to how good of a person he was and um, how genuine he was and how much of a, the opposite of what you expect a celebrity of his stature to be like. And I know a lot of people are out there mourning and putting out some really great stuff about him, so I'm super excited to celebrate that. And uh, he is just... Uh, a wonderful, a wonderful person. So rest in peace, Norm. That that deserves to be its own victory cannon. I'm not adding anything in for the day. And that's it for the Golden Bear Cast. You can find us on Twitter at Golden Bear Cast. You can find us uh, all our written stuff at rightforcalifornia.com. We've also started a subscription service. Uh, so you can get all our premium content up there as well, with, as well as play breakdowns, uh, weekly uh, predictions and a lot more fun content uh, if you found our podcast i don't know i don't need to tell you where to find it and that is all of my plugs and as always go bears go bears We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash Blue Wire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash Blue Wire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed.